And now for the multimedia half of our program tonight, and you'll see what I mean. Our next reader received the Campbell Award for Best New Writer in 2008. And in 2011, her short story, For Want of a Nail, won the Hugo Award for Best Short Story. She's the author of the novels Shades of Milk and Honey and Glamour in Glass, both nominated for the Nebula Award. The sequel, Without a Summer, came out just today and launches here tonight. She also... <laughs> You guys are great. You're doing good. <laughs> she also performs as a voice actor, recording fiction for sh such authors as Sean and McGuire, Corey Doctorow, and John Scalzi. And she's a professional puppeteer, which you may see evidence of tonight. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Mary Robinette Cole. <laughs> Yes, no, that's, yes, yes. <laughs> so 20 years in live theater, I brought my own lighting because every time I watch these videos, I'm like, they're all backlit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that is how my own personal geekdom expresses itself. AV club. Yeah, I have no apologies. Um, so the thing to know about uh, my series is that I write historical fantasy, which basically means that I'm writing books that are like Jane Austen with magic. The magic system is called Glamour. I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail because we kind of get into that in the book. The other thing you should know is that uh, Without a Summer is called that because it's set in the year 1816, which is historically called the year without a summer. Um, that's because in 1815 a volcano went off throwing this enormous amount of ash into the air. Um, like Krakatoa doesn't even hold a candle to this. Um, and it was so big and so much dust that in Washington DC in July they had snow. Uh, the weather that we're having outside right now, sorry, <laughs> has nothing to do with my book. <laughs> So, um, so what I'm going to read for you today is uh, a little bit about, uh, starting with um, my main characters, Jane and Vincent. They're professional glamorists. Um, they have been invited to London and um, are contemplating taking her sister with them. And they're staying with Jane's family in the meantime, and we all know how delightful family is. <laughs> so... Vincent, do you think we might take Melody with us? He straightened his head and regarded her. Would she enjoy it? I think the change of scenery can only do her good, and her marriage prospects would be brighter with London's social season. I suppose. But would she not prefer a husband who could keep her close to your family? Who? Jane waited for Vincent to see that there were, was no one in their neighborhood with eligible sons. He nodded slowly. Then, by all means, she should come. Thank you, my love. Jane traced a hand along his arm. Would you issue the invitation? Under Vincent's sleeve, the muscles of his arm tightened. B. Would she not rather have it from her sister? It would be more natural coming from me, but I think it would mean more if it came from you. A minute whine of protest escaped him, as though he had imperfectly held his breath. He was, to the best of her knowledge, unaware that he made this sound when afflicted with contrariety. Jane had not enlightened him, as it had proved useful to know with what he struggled. She waited as he thought, watching until the lines between his brows smoothed. He nodded. Of course, though I shake at the thought of your mother's answer to our departure. Particularly for a glamour. Taking pity on her husband, Jane said, well... I will relate that much at least. Thank you, Muse. With that settled, she helped him back into his coat and led him down the hall to the breakfast room where the rest of the family still sat at, bre at breakfast. Mrs. Ellsworth had a volume of correspondence before her from acquaintances likewise afflicted with nerves. Mr. Ellsworth kept his newspaper up as a shield, making the occasional noise in answer to his wife's exclamation. 
Melody had his discarded pages. As Jane and Vincent entered, she clipped an item from the paper, likely a description of London fashion. She alone glanced up. You look as though you have news. Mr. Ellsworth folded his paper with interest. I suspect so. Oh, you hurried out of that letter. <laughs> <laughs> Smiling at her father's discernment, Jane nodded. Indeed, we have received a commission from the Baron of Stratton for his London house. London? Her father raised his brow. His gaze darted toward Melody, demonstrating a wish that she might accompany them. Before Jane could answer, Mrs. Ellsworth exclaimed, Oh, I do hope you will decline it. I hardly see how it is possible with your troubles. Sir David, say that you will not accept. Vincent shrank at the sound of his title. He had been simply Mr. Vincent when they met and seemed more comfortable that way, but her husband had become Sir David Vincent when he was raised to the honor of a knighthood last year. He felt it was ostentatious and would have avoided the title altogether if he could, but one did not say no to the Prince Regent. Jane had attempted to explain his preference to her mother, but he would always be Sir David to her. Jane stepped in to save her husband. Mama, you must see that we have already been performing glamours. But you should not try your strength so soon after your troubles. Indeed, you should not. Why, last night you were exhausted after a tableau vivant. What might a glamour will do? <laughs> Mrs. Ellsworth shook her head, the lace of her cap fluttering. I am shocked that you would attempt to work glamour at all. Who knows what might happen? Why, the house might explode. <laughs> Vincent coughed and covered his mouth. Though she was used to her mother's hysterics, even Jane found it difficult not to laugh outright at this notion. That is hardly possible, as glamour is largely ornamental. It could make, if it could make something explode, then that technique would be used in the military. But it does! What if Major Curry? And I do not see why, if cold mongers can make things cold, you could not make something explode! <laughs> Cold mangas can chill things a few degrees only, and it is an... Jane stopped herself from saying unstable, which her mother would misconstrue. It is a purely temporary effect. No, no, they are what is making the weather so unseasonably cold. I have it here in a letter from Lady Warwick, who explains it all. She got it from a lecture in London from Professor Van Reed, and if that is the case, then I see no reason why glamour could not explode. <laughs> I am afraid the lady misunderstood what she heard. The thermal transference alone... Jane broke off again, recognizing the impossibility of Mrs. Ellsworth comprehending the full scientific reasons that her fears were unfounded. The notion that cold mongers could affect the weather was so far from truth as to be ridiculous, and glamour causing explosions was even more so. While it was possible to warm things with glamour, the effort was so great as to be impracticable. Moreover, that form of glamour took an unhealthy toll on its practitioners and resulted more often than not in death. No one used heat glamours for that very reason, but knowing her mother, invoking the mere hint of death would only serve to heighten her fears. You may trust me that cold mangas cannot affect the weather. Melody slid the paper she had cut out closer to Jane. I read something of that. Here it is. Though it is too much to state that the worshipful company of cold mongers is the cause of the current weather, many educated gentlemen of our city have raised the question of whether they might, at least unintentionally, be the cause of alteration in our climate. Oh. Oh, but wait. <laughs> the writer goes on to say that it is not possible. <laughs> there. You see, Mama? Oh, what can a writer know? <laughs> it is too much. <laughs> and in your state... My state is one of general health. Jane glanced at Vincent, who shifted anxiously as if he were about to quit the room. She had no wizard, no re the. I'm a professional narrator. <laughs> she had no wish to revisit the subject of her miscarriage. Vincent still felt it was his fault when he had been as much a victim as she. Though it had happened eight months previous, it seemed as though her mother would fix on nothing else whenever Jane or Vincent picked up a thread of glamour. As they were professional glamorists, 
this presented a few challenges. <laughs> Truly, I have been quite well for some time now. Oh, but you are so pale. I cannot believe that you are in good health. You are so pale, especially when you have such an unhealthy flush to your cheeks. <laughs> Mama, Jane cannot be both flushed and pale. But of course she can. Just look at her, poor dear. I fear Jane's health will never be the same if she continues on in this manner. Jane said firmly. There will be no difficulty in going at once, as we are both quite well. Indeed, Mama, to decline a connection such as this would be to our detriment. Being in London during the season has every advantage. Vincent cleared his throat. <clears> throat> in fact, with the season approaching, we were hoping that Miss Ellsworth might accompany us. Oh! Oh! Unless you do not wish to, of course. Not wish to? Oh, I should adore going to London above all else. The prospect of going to London appeared to affect the sensibility of more than one person in the room. Mrs. El Mrs. Ellsworth clapped her hands together and bounced in her chair like a child a quarter of her age. Oh, London in the season! We shall have such a merry time! Beside Jane, Vincent emitted his trifling whine audible only to her ears. Jane raised a hand to stop her mother's effusions. We had thought to take only Melody with us. You would not wish to leave Papa all alone, and he can hardly leave with all the work to be done around the, s the estate. It is true, my dear. I would be intolerably lonely if you were to go as well. It has been too long since we have had the house to ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but she must have a chaperone. How can Melody go if I do not accompany her and protect her from improprieties? Jane smiled, more than ready with an answer for that objection. Well, that is no trouble at all. As I'm a married woman now, I'm more than able to act as my sister's chaperone. She had the satisfaction of seeing her mother unable to protest. <laughs> more to the point, Vincent stopped holding his breath. <laughs> I also brought a tiny little puppet show with me. Uh, the puppet show is actually out of book one, Shades of Milk and Honey, um, although it is from a show that originated in uh, 1787 uh, called, the Broken, I'm gonna, called The Broken Bridge. I'm going to step away from the microphone and just try to be loud. So it's... Um, you guys are gonna have a really hard time seeing this. Yeah. Come squat over here. <laughs> so 1787, the Broken Bridge was the most popular shadow puppet play of its day. And this is in a time when shadow puppetry was the top entertainment. This show ran for 60 years. I am doing an abbreviated version, and now you see why I actually had the light with me. Um, <laughs> See that okay? Uh -huh. okay. So, um, Broken Bridge, really, you'll see nothing. <laughs> Sit on the floor. You don't have to. If you don't want to see my puppets, it's fine. <laughs> I'm not, you know, hurt. <laughs> okay. So, The Broken Bridge. Um, and photos are totally fine, just don't use a flash because it'll rush out the screen and you won't see anything. <laughs> <laughs> but you a flash? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you want to see? It looks really good. There's no puppet now. <laughs> yeah. But there's a. There's no... I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll stop. Our door. I'm it's fine. <laughs> 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 Please. Thank you. And it reminds me, my art, my art. <laughs> okay, so, the broken bridge. Tra la la, tra la la, tra la la la, tra la la, tra la la, tra la excuse me, tra la la, excuse me, sir, tra la la, excuse me. Eh? Is this the road to London? Oh, no! This year, I don't go nowhere but to the river. Tra-la-la! -la. <laughs> oh. Well, uh, can one cross the river? Aye. Ducks cross the river. Quack-quack! <laughs> Tra-la-la! <laughs> well, 
gravel touches the bottom. Tra-la-la. No! If I were on the other side of the river, I'd tra-la-la you. Tra-la-la. Oh! Tra-la-la. Oh! Tra-la-la. 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 Tra-